Okay, we're back. So last time we were finishing up talking about some of the different uh, metamorphic processes and how the actual mineral changes um, over time. And so going from uh, a meta that metamorphic rock and the crystallization phases, things like that as it changes. And this time we're going to kind of go into talking about the actual processes that causes those things like heat and pressure, right? And so those are the main the main factors in, the, in, the, in this whole story. So when we talk about heat, okay, that enables that recrystallization or metamorphic um, changes, it, you, usually as you go down in the subsurface, you get more and more heat. You're closer lots of times to those radioactive materials that are decaying, and, and plus you have all that material on top where the heat stays in, Okay, kind of like a thermos in a sense. And so as you go down, you get hotter and hotter and hotter in the subsurface. Okay, so as you so the, as a rock is buried, it goes down into the subsurface, it is going to actually get hotter and have more heat involved with it. Well, also as you put more and more sediments on top of it, you're going to ca cause more pressure to be on it as well. Just like if you jump into a swimming pool, go down to the deep end, you're going to have a lot more pressure on you there and there in the deep end than you are going to have in the kiddie pool. Right. Okay. So um, there, there's the different pressure as long as you get as you get more and more and more material on top of it, it's going to have more and more pressure on the rock. This is why metamorphic rocks tend to form in areas where they're deep underground. Okay. And usually from some kind of plate tectonic setting. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but you can probably uh, assume that it's going to be a conversion boundary mostly. Okay. So w there's different types of pressure when we think about this. When we talk about the pressure, we have what we call confining pressures and differential pressures. Co confining pressure means that you have equal pressure on all sides. Okay, so for example, if I had, um, I, I'm not doing this from school today because I my car broke down. Actually, I'm waiting in front of the shop, so I'm here at home doing this um, as it gets fixed. And so I don't have my, 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 um, my things I usually use to, to show this, but think of it this way. There's a big ball, and if you had equal pressure all sides, it would squeeze inwards, right? Okay, squeeze inwards and out, squeeze in and out. And so it would be a, a great example of what we'll call confining pressure. Now, if I get a ball and then start pushing on it on just two sides, it's what we call a differential pressure, which means that I'm not pushing on from the top or the bottom, but only two sides, and therefore it's going to become elongated in the perpendicular to the direction of its stress, right? That makes, hopefully it makes pretty, pretty, uh, pretty easy, it's pretty straightforward there, okay? So there's lots of different types of stress. There's what we call compressional stress, where we're pushing things together, okay? Tensional stress, where we're pulling things apart, or what we call shear, where we're actually sliding past each things with each other. So if you think about this, this is actually really related to our plate tectonic uh, boundaries, right? So compressional stress, convergent boundaries, tensional stress, a, a divergent boundary, and a shear means kind of like a transform, right? So materials can actually be sheared, compressed, or, t or, or have tension associated with them. Tension means if I had a, like a ball of, of silly putty or, or or, or bread dough or something like that, and I started pulling it apart, the dough itself is going to get thinner and thinner and thinner as I pull it apart, right? Whereas if I compress it, it's going to get thicker, right? And that, that, that makes sense. And if I go the other way, it's going to shear or tear apart in, in, in that way. So if, here's some examples. So we have your, your dough here. If I do a, a vertical compression or a differential pressure, notice that it's actually... Um, going out on both sides, therefore becoming more elongated, right? Okay, so if I push on it, you can get this elongate here, these platy kind of structures, um, and that would be what we call a, a differential pressure, okay? So a compressional stress pressure. And then for the shear stress, I could actually get this ball here and then roll it, and roll it's meaning that you'll have more pressure on one side than another, and so it also becomes kind of elongated because of that shear kind of motion. It gets smeared out in a sense, all right? So that would be an, exa an, an example of that stress once more, okay? That differential stress. So that's the, the, the main causes of those processes we talked about before, is the stress and the heat. Well, what types of metamorphism is there? Because there's lots of different settings you can get metamorphism to recur. 
Now, we're going to talk about the two main ones, which is basically regional metamorphism and contact metamorphism. Now, there are other ones out there, and we'll talk about some of them very briefly. Uh, but, uh, but the ones that we're going to really focus on, the ones I really want you to know about, is the regional metamorphism and the contact metamorphism. Okay, so regional metamorphism usually occurs over a large area, usually because of plate tectonics, some kind of conversion plate boundary usually. Okay, whereas contact metamorphism is usually doesn't have the pressure involved with it, but has the heat. It's usually from an igneous intrusion. So a magma body rising up in the subsurface causing um, the, the rock around it to heat up, therefore it has some metamorphic processes changing there. Now, there's other things that could cause uh, metamorphism. We could have meteorite impacts, which we call a shock metamorphism, where the rocks change fairly quickly because of the, the, the direct and very, um, very uh, strong impact. Uh, you can have what we call burial metamorphism, where it, there's, you're just slowly putting material over it. Okay, so there's no added pressure from the plant tectonics, but just burial of materials. Uh, there's seafloor metamorphism, which is uh, that added heat here but then you have the fluids going through there to actually help with the, the motion of, of, of elements. So that, it's that sometimes we call hydrothermal uh, metamorphism there. Okay, and so there's lots of different ones, but we're gonna be focusing on, on, on the regional and con, on contact, right? Okay, so here's the first one, the contact metamorphism. Contact metamorphism has lots of heat associated with it, hardly any pressure, Maybe a little bit of fluids. Okay, those are the three things that we really kind of get things moving: the heat, the pressure, and the fluids. Okay, so we call this what we call a low-grade metamorphism, which means that it hasn't had tons of heat and pressure, so it hasn't had a huge change to it. It's, if it's just heat, we'd call this a low-grade metamorphism. Okay, so it doesn't have say, the same um, uh, factors in play. And so the, the rock's not going to change as much as if you had both heat and pressure together. That's why we call it low grade. Okay, so um, that's what grade basically is. Is the it's basically talking about the um, how much metamorphos metamorphism has occurred, right? Just a little bit or quite a bit. Okay, so something that has just a little bit of pre pressure, just a little bit of heat, we'd call low grade metamorphism. Something that's had lots of heat, lots of pressure over time, we'd call high grade. Metamorphism. Okay, this is, you can do medium in between there. It's a, it's a scale, right? So, so contact metamorphism doesn't have the pressure involved with it. It's just the heat, and therefore low grade. Okay. Whereas regional metamorphism, we have two continents slamming together, and have, or subduction could have metamorphism in them, or you can have continental conduction, uh, convection, conduction, um, convergence. Sorry, could actually have huge amounts of metamorphism as well. Any, any time where you have those two big bodies of, of, of those plates, those rocks slamming into each other, you're going to have lots of, of metamorphism because you have the added heat, added pressure um, involved with that. Plus, you, if you, especially if you have subduction, you can have added fluids in there as well. Okay, so you tend to get high, high can get high grade metamorphism, or you can get low grade. Now, why, why I say that is, is because even though you have materials pushing in this way and this way, you would have a lot more uh, pressure further down than you do up at the top, okay? So you'd have low-grade metamorphism up at the top and maybe high-grade metamorphism down at the bottom. And so there's different types of metamorphic rocks that are formed what we call low-grade metamorphism all the way up to high-grade metamorphism. So here's an example. We could have a clay or, or muds that maybe started off in an ocean basin and then it got um, buried a little bit over time to form what we call that had that shell to form it to a slate. That'd be a low grade metamorphism. Now, if it, as it continued to actually have get pressurized and continued to, um, to add heat to it, you then might be called what we call a phyllite. Okay? Now, if you add even more heat and pressure, it might then become a schist. And then you have even more heat pressure after that, and that might become a nice. Okay, so this is the grades in which we have a low grade slate to a medium grade phyllite and schist to a high grade nice. And we'll talk more about that. But this regional metamorphism can have all types of grades from low to high, depending on where you are in the system. Whereas contact metamorphism usually is only low grade metamorphism. Okay. Then the last one that I need to talk about that I'm just going to talk about for a little bit, and the reason I want to talk about it is because we this is where we get most of our um, our resources from, our geological resources from more hydrothermal metamorphism. And what's really happening here is the water vapor from, from magma down below 
actually starts going up in maybe cracks or fissures as it, as it goes upwards, forming, getting the heavy metals like gold and silver and things like that, go up the veins, crystallize, and then you can get um, uh, mineral resources like copper, gold, silver, and things like that. So here's an example, for example, this is the Kennecott uh, mine in Utah, uh, largest open pit mine in the world, and, uh, and huge amounts of copper. We get about 90% of our copper. I know it's actually lower than that now. I think it's like 80% of our copper for, um, in the United States from this, this one mine. It's huge amounts of, of, of copper. Okay, and it's because of that heat and then the flowing of those fluids that can then move those, recrystallize those that material into other um, settings. Okay, so here we have what we call our metamorphic rocks um, are changing over time. Okay, so they're, how do we class, we classify these rocks, these metamorphic rocks, based off of a couple things. What we call foliations, which has to do with how much pressure is, was exerted on them. But also what its parent rock is, or what its I would be better say said as the protolith, right? Okay, uh, is is what you should have there. Okay, so for example, you can get a shale, a sedimentary rock that's a fine grained muds, um, get deposited, and then it, it goes um, metamorphism, low intensity at first to form what we call a slate. Well, that same thing can then become a schist under more intense metamorphism than a nice under even more intense metamorphism, okay? But it can start off as a shell. Well, rhyolite, which is, comes, is an igneous rock, not a sedimentary rock, also could have a little bit of, of, of metamorphism, and we can call that a slate too, right? Because it has the same textures as the um, slate. And we might call this one a, a little bit different types of slate based off of its chemical composition, but we, we would both call them a slate, okay? A rhyolitic slate or a, or a, a slate from a kind of shell, which is, which is the most common way that slate forms. Now, if you can even more, you can get a schist. So we can call it a rhyolitic schist or maybe a granitic schist or a basaltic schist, okay? All coming from different um, sources, um, source rocks or protoliths to form that schist. And then you can go to your nice, right? So, uh, Metamorphic rocks are, are some really nice rocks, right? It's really bad, bad geology jokes. <laughs> okay, and I, I, I have a, I should have, I should have worn it. I, I should go get it. But anyways, I have a, a, a shirt in my room uh, that on one side of it it says "schist, schist happens," right? <laughs> and and uh, it does. You get from a rock, go from slate to to a shit, to I mean shell to a schist, right? And then on the other side of my shirt it says "have a nice day." Uh, it's it's silly, weird, and stupid <laughs> geologic, ge geology humor. Anyways, the point comes is um, the how we classify the rocks is based off of its parent material and then how much um, what its texture is. So we're going to show you some textures in just a second. Okay, but these ones down here is here's the parent rock again, maybe limestone that can then go to marble. Now, these rocks aren't foliated, whereas these ones are foliated. Okay, and so. Um, let me show you some examples of foliation. So here's some, some examples here. So here we have a granite. Those granite had all these different minerals in, a, in random uh, arrangements, okay? But then we pressurize it. We push it, okay, from both sides. We apply that differential stress. Now what happened before is all those plating minerals who, were, who once were quite random are now all going to be lined up, okay? So you get this, this granite. That could now become a nice. We have the nice, <laughs> the nice bands to it, okay? Or the they're all lining up into this this foliation, okay? So we would call this a nisic banding or foliated bands, okay? Now other bands, other nice, other things you can have, you can have not as um, good of foliations like this, and maybe it's kind of a wavy foliation um, or even solution here where you have, might have a fossil that goes into solution and gets smaller. You can have a, a grain itself get bigger, but also going in the direction of this, what we call its preferred orientation. Okay, so the preferred orientation is always perpendicular to the direction in which um, the pressure is coming. So if it, if it pushed this way, then it's going to go perpendicular to that. That's the preferred orientation. Okay, let's stop there for a second. We'll kind of redo that in just a second in our next group.